she is a professor and the chair of software systems and the head uh, of the Department of Computer Science and Information Systems at the U University of Limerick. Um, uh, she will share her uh, experience with us in, um, in doing functional verification and re for reliability and compliance of complex uh, heterogeneous systems. In her talk, uh, the digital thread paradigm for integration and interoperability models, tools, and platforms, where she will uh, share with us uh, the challenges of uh, do, uh, dealing with smart advanced ecosystems. Uh, welcome, Dr. Tizania. Okay, thank you very much. I am happy to be here and to participate to the FAMEXI conference. Uh, my name is Tiziana Margaria, as I just introduced, I'm a professor of software systems here at the University of Limerick in Ireland. Okay, and uh, I'm trying now to share my slides, <laughs> okay, on the tool, um, which doesn't give me the option on Firefox at the moment. Click on share and then slides. Yes, I don't see the slides. There is no option slides. Maybe we can, uh, uh, okay, there is no option to share anything. Um, okay, there is a, um, Okay, sorry for the debugging. Um, there is settings, there is share, but if I click on that, there is no uh, slides or screenshot. Dr. There is Zania, take. Uh, Walid from our team is following up with you through messages on how uh, to fix this issue with sharing the slides. So please. Yeah, that's the, the best. Because we can use the slides that I had yesterday. Yeah. Sorry for this. Okay, so um, if you can go to the slides at the same time, I can just, you know, explain a little bit, maybe the title. So the digital thread paradigm for integration and interoperability models, tools and platforms. So I'm a software engineer uh, working here in Ireland, uh, both as a researcher and as a teacher. Uh, the research uh, is in a number of uh, research uh, um, institutes, uh, for example, this national uh, research set center on software where I'm located right now, which is called Lero, but also other applied research centers, like for example, Confirm, which is for advanced uh, smart manufacturing, or the LDCRC, which is the Limerick Digital Cancer Research Center. And so I'm responsible for uh, this, uh, uh, for the creation, let's say, of uh, uh, a software, a common software platform across all these uh, um, research uh, institutions and collaborations, okay? Uh, it, it is interesting for ecosystems because uh, um, in reality, we are always collaborating. It is a number of universities typically collaborating with a number of uh, uh, companies on one side because our research center, they are co-invested. So the state is giving something, but also um, the, um, the uh, um, companies are contributing for 50%. And then most of the time, we also have other actors like either um, external international partners. Oh, thank you very much. That's perfect. Great. Um, but also, um, uh, for example, uh, hospitals uh, or other um, NGOs, uh, which are not contributing money, but they are actually contributing the case studies and in kind. Okay. And so uh, for us, it is very important to have uh, integration of uh, processes, data, uh, of applications, and to guarantee interoperability. That's what we call the digital thread paradigm, because it is like, uh, you know, a, a digital uh, yeah, thread that is actually stitching everything together. And uh, there, I think that, of course, we need the platforms, of course, we need tools, but it is important to work in a model-driven approach. And that's, uh, that's the, let's say, the message of this talk. 
So next slide, please. So I don't think that I can. OK, perfect. So um, as I said, the important keywords are ecosystems. And for me, they are basically collaboration spaces, uh, typically relatively large scale because you have different locations, uh, different um, uh, different roles, um, and they can become quite large. I mean, uh, if you're just talking about uh, the platform behind Confirm, it is probably like a, a few hundred uh, different uh, individuals that are working on that from uh, research um, and so on okay um the uh, they are typically diverse uh, so um as i said already different actors with different competencies and different responsibility and the most important thing is that they are loose so it is not like inside a company where there is maybe a standard policy and everybody has to follow it enforcing some kind of uh, alignment or technological uh, technological sharing or whatever um it's always voluntary okay and so it is more built uh, on the convenience uh, and on the advantages that people see in in doing things together and sharing uh, whatever it is uh, processes or data but there is no real enforcement potential, so to say. So let's see if I can, yeah. Um, the example, for example, for, from Confirm, to give you an idea, is that the vision was uh, four years ago, we are now going into the four years review, to fundamentally transform uh, industry towards a smart manufacturing ecosystem, okay? It was composed by um, uh, a number of uh, um, entities in the entire country, which is on the next slide. I don't seem to be able to control it, actually. OK, um, so you see that over six years, it was quite a significant amount of funding, uh, a number of uh, uh, principal investigators, a number of industry partners that, are, as I said, our co-funding partners. Uh, it was uh, eight core universities that have grown since then, plus eight national research and technology centers uh, and a lot of international collaborators. So on the next slide, we see um, uh, the distribution of this. You can see actually in the center, okay, the confirm uh, family, uh, but you see that we have uh, the research part and the um, and the universities in the inner circle on the on the left. Then you see all the companies, but on top of that, there are all the international uh, collaborations that we have, and then of course the general ecosystem for the companies, which is the infrastructure that they have, the suppliers and the customers. And in particular, in the last two years, with uh, uh, the disruption that we have seen, uh, there has been a significant significant um, uh, weight given to the external partnerships, especially for supply and supply chains. Okay, so in the next slide we see, okay, we would see if we had a, <laughs> in, um, animations, uh, we see that there is a similar vision, so to say, in Limerick, which is a very, very dynamic uh, city in the Midwest of Ireland, uh, for a number of other things, for example, for health. So it starts actually originally with having a university that you see, uh, you know, in one corner and the hospital, which is the regional model hospital uh, in the bottom. Uh, then they started actually to work together and create courses of medicine. For example, uh, the uh, graduate entry medical school, which is GEMS, which is the first uh, and only, so to say, I think in the country, uh, which uh, uh, follows the American uh, method, for example, of having graduate students entering in medicine and then doing a lot of learn by doing there. Um, it was very successful, so we started to create uh, the Health Research Institute, which in the university connects uh, all the people in different disciplines, including myself as a software engineer, but the lawyers and others that have to do uh, with, uh, um, uh, with health. Out of that, there came some kind of seed funding for some kind of collaborative, uh, let's say mid-size um, uh, consortia. So we got uh, initially 300,000 euros, uh, which is not much uh, for the UL Cancer Network, UL Can that you see down there, um, with which we basically you know, uh, paid a couple of uh, bursary students uh, and uh, a little bit of support to some master students. Out of that, because the collaboration was working really very well, we developed uh, the Limerick Cancer Research Center, which is quite, uh, quite significant. And we have uh, big initiatives that include now Northern Ireland, which is part of the UK, and the island of Ireland, okay, the Republic of Ireland. The same happens in smart cities. We are actually on the previous slide. <laughs> um, in the smart cities, it's also started with the Limerick, uh, with the local authorities and the university. And out of that, uh, a lot of European projects and so on uh, came together. 
So the situation is that we have uh, software neat ecosystems. In the software neat ecosystems, um, oops, uh, I'm seeing actually the previous, uh, the, yeah, I'm still on the previous slide. Um, we have uh, social technical systems uh, that are connecting uh, people, um, things, and software. Okay. The software includes data, artifacts, and processes. Um, so, um, if we go and consider the, the digital transformation, for example, uh, the social technical systems correspond to communities. Uh, we have their uh, various activities that are ca uh, being carried out. One is education, of course, uh, bring the knowledge of digital transformation to the different communities. Uh, one aspect, of course, is the uh, automation. One other aspect uh, is, of course, uh, to try to uh, reach more people, so inclusion and also opportunities. And this typically is done by means of uh, different kinds of uh, analysis that are coming from the business school. So if you look, for example, at the UN um, SDGs uh, that have been uh, presented to you very quickly uh, in the previous couple of slides, the question is for a company or for an entity, so to say, how can you work profitably, so to say, with them in changing situations? So what typically would happen is that you would have uh, a number of consultants that are coming to you, okay? They are going to pre-analyze, depending on your, on your sector, uh, in which one of uh, these uh, sustainable development goals you are finding yourself. Most of the time, they find the two or three main ones and a couple of other that are secondary. So they, they happen to, uh, to be met or to be addressed just because you're doing certain things or certain things in a different way. OK, so it is not just one goal, even if you are in a specific uh, context. So what typically happens is that after that, uh, they come uh, to you and they ask you actually in a, some kind of workshop uh, whether um, for example, you can um, uh, improve your um, alignment with these SDGs. So it is typically a question of how to do it, getting guidance, and then having a multi-perspective uh, uh, approach, which typically is not just the sustainability, but most of the time it connects also risk and legal aspect and energy and technology, et cetera, et cetera. But just let's concentrate on sustainability and risk, okay? So when that happens, Typically, what happens is that you get a workshop where the sustainability trends that have been identified are connected with some kind of generic sustainability risks. For example, the disruption of the um, supply chains uh, that, that has happened in the last two years. And uh, this is typically one workshop with some people. Um, the outcome of this is uh, you know, some kind of document. Uh, the second step is the identification of sustainability risks. Then they, there is a risk matrix that is created, and then the, you come to the operational level. So you see on the left side, so to say, the typical sequence of workshops that are done. And there is not much materialized out of that, okay? Um, so our approach using technology is actually to transform this as an application so that you can basically have the generic process, which is this one mapped, so you see, examine the external context is the first phase. Then you analyze the risk perspective. That's the second phase. Then you oper operationalize the mitigation. And this is the third phase. And each one of them, if we go inside, consists of actually sub-processes sub that you can fill up with your, um, uh, in your company or in your organization and with your collaborator. After this, you still have uh, your data. You have your artifacts, like, for example, the list of risks or the, um, uh, the um, uh, risk matrix or something like this. And you can basically reconsider them and reanalyze them and rework them and update them as a, as a working tool. OK, so the way it works is actually explained in the next slide where you see, OK, so this is the main um, the main um, uh, model okay, that you have, but uh, each step, so to say, is exploded into the own process. And one aspect, so to say, of the risk analysis is then explained on the right side, where you see really a process, a process model with a data model, with a control flow and the data flow and everything. You are basically at the level of software. So you see that we can model this kind of complex processes and out of these lower level uh, workflows when you have it for everything we can generate code and they also reuse uh, actually existing building blocks uh, for example okay the ones that are dealing with canvas and so on in the um, uh, in the atomic steps that are there so you see that basically the translation of the manual process to models 
is possible it delivers actually full applications and it is uh, very understandable also by people that are not able to program because it is pretty logical so to say to follow these workflows okay so coming with that from that to the digital thread okay in the next slide uh, we see that uh, this is very important to bridge the gaps through it so we still have the social technical uh, systems so, so the people are now the experts on one side which may not be programmers in particular the people that are responsible accountable have to be consulted or need to be informed so the raci let's say uh, group of stakeholders the things that you're talking about are typically resources either knowledge resources or it resources or data or machines or any other kind of resources that you have and then software Software turns out to be actually the lace, okay, the almost invisible, the more immaterial it is, the better, the most precious, so to say, that actually connects this all and de facto rounds the world. So the data is the equivalent of raw material. They basically represent knowledge and facts. The processes are the how. We talk very often about know-how, okay? So that's exactly the materialized processes. It's workflow algorithms. I would call it the recipes, so to say, of how to run the world. And then if you look at the governance of all this, this is basically formalizing the rules of the game. So it could be constraints, it could be legal um, aspects like GDPR, it could be needs of being, you know, high safety or uh, very secure or very trustable. And they basically represent bounding boxes, so to say, on the space of potential solutions, okay, that you can have in your workflows. And so the artifacts are moving from the programs to the models. So to give you an example from Confirm, we had a, a, where we are implementing a low-code way to remotely control robots. So it's a different story from, um, from the um, uh, example that we had before. Uh, we can do it very efficiently because we are actually writing very little code, working on models most of the time. So our example is from the uh, universal robot uh, machines. These are cobots. Uh, so in the next slide, um, these are cobots that um, are um, uh, basically uh, machines, robots, uh, arms, so to say robotic arms that can work together with humans uh, instead of being closed in cage. So they are cobots in the sense that they are collaborative and it is possible to control them um, in a, with a programming language, but typically by means of a tablet PC that is connected with a cable, so to say, two, two, man, two meter cable uh, to the machine. So it is what we call a tethered uh, controlling machines, right? We want to do predictive, predictive maintenance or proactive maintenance. So you could basically be somewhere, like I say, in Cairo or in Kampala, controlling a machine that is sitting, you know, somewhere in a, um, in a Nigerian <laughs> oil field or so, right? Or maybe uh, in the J and J automation um, uh, office, or in the analog devices uh, catalyst lab, right? So you want to actually be able to control these machines from somewhere else. So what we created is actually a controller that is running over the web. You see the main screen here. And if you look at the next slide, you can see uh, that actually we have this controller that is uh, steering the robot. You see on the display that we are running actually the controller. It is controlling realities from somewhere else. If we were able to play videos, you would see that somebody is coming there, changing a configuration, and the robot moves, for example, goes to some kind of rest position okay, or standard position. And if you are looking at the way we are doing it in the next slide, you will see that uh, basically there is very little code that it is basically models. So you see at the bottom the screenshot that I was mentioning, above it uh, in colors, the model of the GUI. From the model, we generate almost half of the workflow that you see uh, uh, in the middle. Um, the single uh, elements of these, they are either uh, new web pages or these kind of structures with the same kind of control flows and data flows that we saw already before for a completely different applications here on the right. And the uh, elements that we are using there, they are actually the primitives coming from the API, from the programming language of the UR3 robot. And uh, we can apply this method, so to say, very generically uh, to every kind of application, whether it is ERP, whether it is e-learning, whether it is uh, healthcare and, uh, uh, you know, um, electronic healthcare records, for example, or whether it is uh, uh, bioinformation systems uh, or, you know, um, this has been done before and we have research on this. It works very well and it is a sort of an abstract but understandable language 
on models where you can actually explain the effects and create the effects of programming without having to know and master the code. Okay, so if we continue, uh, you can see that uh, what we did was actually to even create an automatical, uh, automatically learned by means of some kind of AI digital twin out of this. So we take the system, the robot on one side and the controller on the other side as a, the general system, and we are trying to find out what it is able to do. So in the next slide, we see a model that we extracted automatically by means of uh, exploration of this. So if you're a software engineer, I can tell you that this is actually running uh, automatic test pattern generation or test case generation, and then basically applying uh, um, uh, active automata learning in order to condense to the minimal um, model that is uh, coherent with all the observations, okay? You can have it raw this way, or you can analyze it. For example, in the next slide, we see that there are some uh, states that are working together, working for certain applications, so doing mo motions of, of the arm, or um, um, uh, doing reconfiguration by means uh, of the web application, or just are error states in which you go if there is anything going wrong. Okay. And so basically, we are able to create this digital twin of this particular machine during the particular uh, application in a very, very uh, efficient way. And we can use it together with other models. So, so that's a second use of models that we have. Okay. So altogether, if we are looking at this, the local no code paradigm is very, very helpful for this because it basically uses models. We use it in order to be able to do analysis of these models, okay, uh, to do code generation, and in particular to reuse building blocks. And this is very, very useful, so to say, also in terms of our SDGs, because it allows you to reuse, reduce the errors, reduce the waste, reduce the time, cost, and energy, so to say, of testing in particular. Because if you get the models right, and then you have a correct code generator, then the code that you get is actually uh, correct, okay? And you just have to deal with runtime errors, for example. So the way we are actually going to do is, is basically to integrate different domains uh, from the bottom up, okay? So for example, in the case of Confirm, you have a factory where there, is, there are lots of machines on the ground. There are the people that are working with that. There is the logistics and so on. And on the other side, you have your business goals that are very distant, so to say, from anything that you can do directly and apply directly to the machines. And so in the next step, we see that we try to actually bridge the gap because we are actually creating some kind of domain-specific languages for the business for example, the sustainability and risk uh, modeling blocks, okay? And on the other hand side, you try to create abstractions of the machines, which are basically, for example, the interfaces with which uh, you are able to, um, uh, to operate on them, or even middleware, like for example, the Edge X for the um, industrial IoT, okay? So you see that uh, still there is a big gap between this kind of DSL abstract level and the DSL that you can uh, talk to the machines uh, through the configuration. So uh, there is uh, something in the middle that is really important, which is a sort of a black box, okay, which is here a green box, which is this integration and communication middleware, which on the south interface allows to physically test and deploy, you know, all the applications, okay? And on the north, so to say, it allows you to do virtual uh, test and deployment loops, so sort of simulations, what if, okay, analysis. And you see that you could have a digital twin used for uh, both the upper and the lower, uh, let's say, use. But what is in this building block, okay? Typically, it used to be middleware stitched together by hand, Right now, we are doing using digital twins, of course, but also a lot of uh, uh, modeling and modeling also of the workflows and the applications so that we can create, as I showed to you, digital twins, not just of the machine and the capabilities of the machine, but digital twins of the application in a context, which is very important in order to uh, allow uh, quick analysis and evolution, okay? so. The concrete situation is that in the South interface, we are going to use digital twins and models in order to uh, carry on this uh, uh, physical test and deployment loop. It's what we call the digital thread on the floor, which is basically, okay, managing the sensing, acting, and integration loop. That's the digital thread, so to say, um, across all these things uh, mediated by software and models. And on the North interface, uh, on the contrary, 
we are going to have, uh, uh, additionally to this, a use of the digital twins uh, for the business purposes. So that we can, um, in the next slide, yes, uh, show that we can do prediction, analysis, support the decision loop with what if. Okay, that's very important for us. We have tried to do exactly the same also in the healthcare uh, domain, where, for example, we are constructing now in this uh, in these months a cancer patient digital thread in uh, uh, the D5 uh, subset, so to say, or, or work package of the Lim Limerick Digital Cancer Research um, uh, Institute that I mentioned actually before. I'm responsible for this work package, the data management and workflows, so the data and processes. You see that it is again connecting. And so what we are doing is actually ex exactly exploiting the same, the same architecture. We are actually reusing a lot of the uh, building blocks that we have created for Mm, sending emails, SMS, uh, alerting and escalation, so to say, for predictive maintenance. They can be applied uh, exactly the same way in any kind of emergency response, for example, or in any kind of notifications, a layer notification, for example. Um, we are adding new um, uh, components here in this case, for example, for the data analytics that is connected with uh, uh, patient data. So uh, connecting R, uh, connecting various uh, uh, databases, um, you know, uh, SQL or non-SQL, like MongoDB, who is one of our uh, partners, and uh, um, as well as uh, different kinds of AI. Okay, so uh, the way how these processes work, they connect the data, they use the knowledge, uh, you build the programs and deliver the outcomes. Okay. And we do it actually with the uh, uh, clinical uh, experts that would not be able to program. And in the Limerick Digital Cancer Research Center, we have, in fact, uh, uh, with this kind of uh, technology, it is the same blueprint, okay, a number of applications. For example, a, a patient information portal, which we call the CanTrust, okay, Cancer uh, Trustable Information. Uh, the MyMM, which is the um, myeloma um, uh, di diagnosis tool. Okay, we have a data analytics application. And so in the UL Cancer Network, which has now become a part of the Limerick Digital Cancer Research Center, we are uh, doing a lot of things that concern data, processes, executable models, um, but they also use the reasoning and the classification. So we are working uh, in the Center of Research Training in AI. There are PhD students, I'm the director of that. They are working actually on this kind of application. And we are now migrating the digital twin extraction, so to say, um, uh, technology that we saw already applied uh, to a manufacturing system uh, to, for example, the digital twin of the application that is doing the uh, myeloma diagnosis is automating actually this uh, patient risk stratification algorithm okay we are going to use it also for educational workflows so that's the digital transformation so that we are actually using the behavioral models of systems uh, that we are creating this way both for understanding and for communicating. So uh, you try to understand, you start to craft actually how it works. And then when you have to train new people, when you have to communicate with other units, you can use them as a reified uh, piece of knowledge of the know-how, okay? And so the core here is actually going from programs uh, which are really like Latin to everybody, to models. And it is important to have not just data models, but the models of the application, what I was saying, what is happening before and after the steps, the alternatives, the exception handling, the different cases and so on, which is basically hierarchical, fully fledged, so to say, procedural programs um, in order to, uh, to uh, leverage the full, uh, the full power, so to say, of these behavioral models. And in our opinion, OK, they address uh, this number of SDGs that we have there, directly or indirectly, um, not only improving the life uh, and improving the inclusion, but also eliminating waste, because this way of doing things uh, spends less time in testing over and over again of mistakes that don't happen because by generating the code by means of uh, proven compilers, you can basically eliminate a lot of, of uh, implementation mistakes. So simplicity is the king, okay? So thank you very much for your patience. And I think we have a couple of minutes for questions. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Tizania, very much. Um, any questions?
I, I think many talks highlighted uh, today about um, uh, being less dependent on writing code and be more dependent on model-driven development and using model in building applications to uh, achieve more reli reliable and um, uh, more strong ecosystems uh, for software um, that can support complex and advanced systems. Uh, if you have uh, uh, any questions, feel free to uh, share now with Dr. Tizania. Um, any offline questions can also be received on the conference platform. Uh, so Dr. Tizania, you. so you, you can check uh, the platform also for any questions from the audience, because there are all online audience also uh, joining. Okay. Uh, and any question from anyone in the hall? I will be happy to answer any questions that come also in the next uh, in the next hours or you know until tomorrow and so on during the course of the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much Dr. Tizanian. We are we, it was our pleasure joining us.